Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the second of our new In The Know webinars brought to you by Max. My name is Gary Gibson and I'm the CEO of the RSL and Services Clubs Association. And it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to this second in our series. I'm happy to welcome representatives from venues across New South Wales, and we even have a couple from interstate. So welcome everyone. Uh, today's session uh, on managing your finances, uh, protecting cash flow, financial sustainability and profit uh, is a very key issue for all of us as we move towards opening our venues and uh, rebuilding our businesses. Today we are joined by uh, three eminent speakers who will each in turn present a series of slides and talk to the topic. Uh, our three presenters today are Greg Russell, a principal partner from Russell Corporate Advisory, Henry Kouakis from Bank Tech, and Clayton Everly, uh, partner in audit for BDO. At the bottom of your screen, you will see an icon that enables you to type a question for the presenters. So if you have a question you wish to ask during the presentation, please type that question and we'll either ask it at the end of each presenter's uh, session or we will, when we finish all three presentations, we'll try and answer as many questions as possible. At the end of this presentation, there will also be a slide shown, which gives you the contact details for each of the three presenters today. So if there are further things you would like to discuss with each of the presenters, please make sure that you make note of their email address and their mobile phone number, and you can follow up with them after the webinar. So <clears throat> today, I'm just going to change our slides now and hand over to our first presenter, Greg Russell from Russell Corporate Advisory. Welcome, Greg. Thanks, Gary. Um, and thank you very much for having, having me and, and uh, allowing us to uh, share our thoughts with the industry. Uh, I've prepared a presentation which is uh, around um, Make financial and strategic planning in the context of reopening now. Um, when when we were first invited to this session, we were, we were talking about uh, the club industry when it was still closed. So a lot changed in, in two weeks. Um, so the subject matter is, is still relevant um, because we, we are still in a very much changed world. And um, whilst we are probably feeling a lot better about ourselves as an industry, given that we're open. That doesn't mean that the pressures and the issues have gone away. So I've prepared this presentation um, for you. I'll just share, I'll share the, uh, the presentation on the screen now. Um, and um, the, the slides that I've prepared um, address um, the fact that history may be no guide, um, possibly our previous planning needs to be dismissed. Um, we need to talk about conservatism in a new way with more focus and the need for dynamic, dynamic forecasting uh, has never been greater. So that's the sort of the broad subject matter that I'm going to cover. Um, but I guess starting where we are today, um, we've never been uh, through an industry closure so the history, the historical trading, uh, the patterns that we've seen in the past may represent nothing to do with the future. Um, the problem at the moment is we just don't know. Um, we've never had a community that's been in lockdown prevented from socialising, prevented from visiting their friends. Uh, how will they react? They, they may react uh, in an extreme way and, and do more socialising than they've ever done. But then again, they may also go the other way and be conservative and just see how the world goes as, as things start to loosen up. We've never had social distancing. Uh, we've never had to be aware of standing so many metres from a person. Um, we've never had to leave gaps in queues. Um, we have had recessions in the past but we haven't had them in recent history and in, historically the hospitality sector has done reasonably well through recessions but whether that will be the case this time no one knows um, we are just not sure of 
of what the future is. But where does that leave us in terms of um, how we deal with our, with our business? Well, Greg, uh, we can't see your slides. Have you put your slides up on share screen yet? Oh, I thought I had. Um, beg your pardon. All right, is that better? Yes, there they are, thank you. I apologize for that. Uh, I won't repeat everything that I've said, um, but uh, essentially the first slide we've gone through, um, what the overview of the presentation is, and, and now we're really, I've been talking about the fact that, that the reasons why history may be no guide to the future being um, industry closure, um, we've, just, we've just not had that before. Um, Community lockdown, we've not had social distancing, we've not had, we have had recessions. But because of all the things we've never had, we have no precedent to, to uh, guide how our future might be. Um, so it means that we really have to engage our brains in a very uh, serious way to think about what the business will be like. And um, that means, I guess, a, a new level um, of conservatism. Um, needs to be present. So the other unknown is the virus. Um, how do we cope with a re-emergence of COVID-19 after we open? What impact will that have on, on, on our businesses? Uh, what impact will that have on our relationships with our bankers? What will they expect of us to hold in reserve to be able to cope with a temporary closure perhaps? So there's a lot that needs to be factored in how we think about the future, how we, how we make decisions about what we hold in reserve, what we should have in our, in our, in our back pocket for a rainy day. Uh, historically, some, some clubs have held liquidity at, at, at values that people say, well, that's, that's an expensive exercise when you've got debt. Um, but some of those clubs have fared very well as a result of that conservatism through this period. And I think if you look back in history, none of us ever presented a strategic plan that provided for an industry closure of one, two or three months or for any period at all. Uh, but Can I, I interrupt you again, Greg? You need to um, put your PowerPoint slides on presentation mode, on, on transition. On I'm doing well today. Sorry. <laughs> so up at slideshow. That's it. That's it. Yep. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt, Greg. That's all right. I won't repeat them. Uh, I'm going to get a five out of ten for this one. Anyway, uh, the content is still there. It's just now probably more legible for you. Um, but not having had the virus before, uh, it, it, it does introduce this new new concept into our business planning. We, we do have to potentially provide for some level of disruption again. We can't completely ignore it. And I expect that our financiers will probably want us to do that. The other thing that um, we need to think about in terms of long-term viability um, is that the, the industry compression that was already occurring is going to accelerate. Um, we, we had a pathway prior to COVID-19, which saw a reduction in the number of venues. Um, COVID-19 is not going to help that, that, that pathway um, to, to slow down, it'll accelerate it. And perhaps what we would have seen occur over 10 to 15 years may occur in one. So from my perspective, amalgamations and consolidation fit more in the picture than they ever have done and currently in, in my office we're working on uh, well six really uh, amalgamations currently two of them arose before the COVID-19 crisis and four have, have come uh, during the period of the crisis so that 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 process is already starting to accelerate uh, I think it's the first time in certainly in my career that I've ever had so many amalgamations on foot at the one time so that I think is a, is a sign of things to come. There's a lot of clubs that are, are seeking to um, uh, express interest in amalgamating many, many as, as the parent club. Um, so I think those that are concerned about what their future might be should have a, a very serious think about where amalgamation might take them. And that needs to be part of the financial planning. It needs to be one of the exit strategies that perhaps now comes into your um, strategic planning or your business planning if you can't see a way forward. 
So when you're looking at the actual plan itself, um, the questions that you need to get answers for, um, what will the opening revenue be? Well, the good news is I guess that uh, Monday's trading figures are in and, and, um, and some of Tuesday's, and generally everyone's quite happy. I think most people are describing Monday's trading as, as like a Saturday. Um, so there's perhaps an initial guide, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't be projecting uh, on, on too optimistic a basis just based on one day. Um, how can we reduce our fixed costs when you're looking at your financial plans? Um, and I guess one of the things in Clubland is, that has always been difficult to deal with are some of the things that are generally just described as untouchable. You can't touch that or they'll walk away. Effectively, what I'm saying is the sacred cows are no longer sacred cows. If you've got an element in your business that is just a cost with very limited utility and very limited benefit to the community, except for perhaps a very noisy minority, now might be the time to address some of those sacred cows um, under the, uh, well, not, not the cover, under the fact that COVID-19 has taken a massive slice of capacity away from the club. Um, focus on your margins, really have a good understanding of what, what dollar you're driving from each aspect of your business. Uh, and even in the best of times, I think back in the RSL uh, last conference, Gary, I talked about the contribution from various um, operating departments in one of my presentations. And if you're lucky in clubs, you, you might be getting two or three cents, maybe a little bit more to the bottom line out of every dollar in catering. Um, most clubs didn't achieve that. So understanding what your catering is doing for you in this post-COVID world is going to become more important. Understanding what gaming is doing for you is going to become more important. I think you also have to look at the fact that you're going to have an increased cost of doing business on a per dollar of revenue basis because of the simple fact of increasing hygiene standards. Um, clubs now have new new positions, a, a hygiene officer, uh, COVID marshal, um, a, a whole range of, a whole raft of creative new titles for, for clubs, which all come at a cost. So you need to incorporate that into your future planning. Your forecasting needs to be dynamic. Um, you need to have a model that works for you that shows the what if of changing certain parameters. So if, if you change an operating cost now, um, you need to understand what that does in your, your future outcomes, both in terms of cash and profit, um, what impact it has on your, your financial covenants with your bank. Uh, and you've got to be able to change that quickly because the business environment we're in now is going to change quickly. Hopefully, um, the, the, the starting point being conservative will serve you well because if you have the, the chance and business goes as you wish, you might get to increase your projections and show a much more favourable result. But it would be wrong and, and dangerous to start at an optimistic level and then have to scale them back because things didn't go as well as you'd hoped. So uh, having that tool is going to become more and more important. Having something that's flexible uh, is is important because you need to be able to deal with it. Um, I, that basically covers my presentation. There's a slide there that shows the contact details if you've got questions. Um, I don't want to go too long. I think I've probably used my seven minutes, haven't I, Gary? So, yes, you have, but that's that's fine. That that's good. All right, Greg, thank you very much. Uh, and as you see there, uh, you can see Greg's email address and uh, phone numbers if you wish to follow up Greg's presentation today and, uh, and seek some more uh, information. Uh, and I'll put those contact details up again at the end of the webinar. Thank you okay. for that, Greg. Our second presentation is from Henry Kouakis. Uh, Henry is the state sales manager for Bank Tech, which is uh, in many cases an ATM provider in a lot of venues, but also has a whole range of cash management solutions that uh, he uh, is able to provide for clubs. So Henry, if you're able to load your slides on. And you'll also need to take yourself off mute. Yes, sir. And uh, I welcome Henry Kouakis to the presentation. Thanks. I will just uh, get this in presentation mode. The joys of going second. Um, 
Thanks for the opportunity, Gary, and to all the club managers that have made the time to come along. Look, I've tried to keep my information short and concise and hopefully relevant to some things that could be something that could help the club industry and club managers today. Uh, I want to talk to you guys about cash versus FPOS and how does this affect my business. And the first thing I want to talk about is cash. <clears throat> there, are, there are many myths circulating that the use of cash can increase the risk of spreading COVID-19. These, these are not correct. Um, the Royal Australian Mint specifically on their website talk about the fact that uh, they support the advice of experts that proper hygiene is essential when you're touching any object surface, not just cash, um, that, and that if that surface is contaminated. So yes, it does include coins and banknotes, <clears throat> but I think it's an important clarification for everybody to know that there is no increased risk of sp spreading that COVID-19 virus if you're using notes or coins. Interestingly, the World Health Organization state on their uh, website that banknotes and coins have some chance of transmitted, co transmitting COVID-19, but it's, it's as risky as any other surface that they may come in contact during a normal purchase experience. So whether it was a shopping trolley, a handrail, a lift button, or whether it's keypads, mobile phones, or bank cards used for tap and go, they're all equally risky in terms of if the virus is there, it's gonna be spread. So it's an important clarification to know that cash is no riskier than anything else we're doing inside your venue. Cash poses no greater risk than any other forms of payment. And importantly for New South Wales gaming venues, cash is a necessity because every gaming transaction must start and finish with cash. Also, when cash is significantly reduced in a venue, it often requires you to buy cash in from your CIT provider, and obviously that comes at the club's expense to do that. Talking about the use of FPOS, I just wanna share some information that I hope can be of benefit to you guys. There has been a very increased usage of FPOS payments being debit and credit every year. We're all seeing that you'd see it in your own businesses and certainly retailers are seeing that. Now, interestingly, in general retail, ATM transactions have declined approximately 25%. And <clears throat> that's simply because these contactless payment systems and, and tools are becoming more and more common in retail. So certainly ATM transactions outside of our industry are declining at 25%. But it's an interesting comparison that ATM transactions in the hospitality sector, specifically gaming venues, are only declining at around 3% each year. So whilst clubs are moving to tap and go and FPOS, we see this potential 3% decline each year but as a result of gaming, we're certainly not seeing the decline as much as the retail sector are. As FPOS usage increases, be aware of the merchant fees being charged by your FPOS provider. Uh, merchant fees charged by payment service providers can vary. So they're not all charging the same rate. You need to look into that and make sure you're you know, well looked after in that area. An interesting point that, that is important to understand is that most cards issued in Australia are what we call dual network cards. Now, what that means is these cards support international payment schemes like Visa and MasterCard, but they also support the domestic FPOS network. This means that debit card transactions can be routed through either network. So, when your patrons are using their cards, it's your merchant services provider, your FPOS provider, who's making the decision of which path they're routing this transaction. Are they sending it via Visa or MasterCard? Or are they sending it via the domestic FPOS network? 
of, of importance here, when a patron inserts their card into the FPOS terminal, the card holder determines how that transaction is routed. And they do that because they're selecting on the FPOS terminal, whether this is check savings or credit. So anytime that card is inserted, it's the card holder who is making that decision. But for a contactless transaction, which is tap and go, the card holder is not actually given a choice and the transaction is usually routed to international networks for processing like Visa and MasterCard. Increased use of tap and go. So contactless transactions or tap and go as a lot of people know it, they were capped at $100 per transaction. So with, with a purchase of up to $100, as you guys are probably already aware, a patron can either scan, tap their card or scan the phone that has a, uh, a credit card saved in there. They can make a purchase of up to $100 and they don't even need to enter a PIN and it gets approved. Purchases over this amount can still be used via this contactless form, but it just means they've got to enter a PIN if the value exceeds $100. Since COVID-19, selective merchants have increased the limit to $200 per transaction. So when a customer pays with tap and go under $200, the merchant is still deciding which scheme to route this transaction. Uh, in most cases, what they do is they look at which scheme, Visa, MasterCard or FPOS, which scheme makes them the most profit, they send it down that path, but the flip side to that is it's costing your business more. There is a concept called least cost routing that I wanted to share with you. Least cost routing is where the merchant who is your FPOS service provider, they choose to route a debit transaction to the lowest cost network for that transaction which in many cases is the FPOS transaction. But unless you're on a least cost routing program, that doesn't happen. Let me give you an example. If I walked into your venue and I made a purchase on a debit card for $80, if that was sent via the FPOS link, it could cost 15 cents for that transaction or depending on your rate from your FPOS service provider, it could cost you 1% of the total if it's sent via the international networks. In this example, if your venue um, has least cost routing versus letting the FPOS provider decide which path to send it, you could potentially be paying 15 cents as a merchant fee for that transaction instead of 80 cents for that transaction. There's a significant difference there. And that's on an $80 transaction. So the higher the value, the higher the fee. Now in a large club where you're doing thousands of transactions every month, um, this can quickly add up to be a significant amount. So have a discussion about least cost routing with your FPOS provider. It's certainly in these tough times where you've all gone through some challenging financial difficulties, there's an opportunity to certainly look at your cost base by going back to your FPOS provider and talking to them about least cost routing. Now I do have uh, a, a little paper that's been used by, our, by the industry about least cost routing and Gary, I'm happy to make that available to any club managers that are interested in just learning a bit more about this concept of least cost routing. Well, thank you, Henry. I mean, we can organize to have that sent out to everyone uh, after this webinar, if that works for you, because we have the email addresses of all the uh, audience today. Perfect. My last slide, I just wanted to touch on the notion of cash for gaming. Now, currently in New South Wales, obviously a gaming transaction must commence with cash being inserted into an EGM. From that point, once the cash is in the EGM, obviously credits can be transferred to tickets or cards for further play or for collection. 
but the initial point is always cash. Digital wallets and digital payment platforms are becoming increasingly common. And I've just got an image there that you can see. We're seeing this in our everyday lives. Um, I have got less cards in my wallet now because I have them all in my phone. And as we sit today, I have my driver's license, my two credit cards, my Medicare card, and many of the uh, retail venue loyalty cards all on my phone, which means they're no longer physically having to be in my wallet. And even externally, you, we're all seeing payments more and more being done using the, the smartphones. And even the good old Opal card eventually may disappear because most of these things will all be done with digital wallets and digital platforms. Now, with this technology rapidly evolving, our industry is developing a framework for the use of digital wallet technology in gaming machines. There's a lot of work to be done there, but I just wanted you guys to be aware that those conversations are actually underway with government and regulators around how this digital, the evolution of digital payments could evolve into gaming as well. So my message to you would be, while you're looking after the immediate needs of your customers, cash and FPOS for payment solutions, keep an eye on the future as well with digital wallets and digital payments as they continue to increase. I would talk to your gaming system provider as well about their view of digital wallets where they're up to, what are they doing? It's a very important conversation that you could be having with them so that if this was made available, you wanna be able to move quickly and offer that service to your patrons who wanna take it on. That's it from me. I've got my details there. Gary can also circulate that and uh, I will certainly forward Gary the least cost routing paper that I've got that can be shared with you as managers that's an immediate benefit that you could look into. Excellent, thank you very much, Henry. I appreciate that. And again, have a look at uh, Henry's email address there and mobile number, should you want to follow up Henry's presentation today. Okay, so uh, our third presenter to today is Clayton Everly. Clayton is the audit partner for BDO and is in fact the association's new auditor. We're delighted to welcome Clayton and BDO to that role for the RSL and Services Clubs Association. And I invite Clayton now if you want to load up your slides um, and present. And I'll remind everyone again that at the bottom of your screen, there is an icon called Q&A. If you have any questions you wish to ask for any of the presenters, please make sure that you uh, type that question in and I'll either raise it for you, or if we can't do it today, we'll uh, send it to the relative uh, speaker to present. Thank you, Clayton. Thanks, Gary. You're just checking you can see my slides, is that correct? Yes, yes. Cool. Thank you. Uh, and yeah, thank you for the time, Gary, and looking forward to working with you in, in, with the, in the association. Uh, look, the, the, I'll just, these are the four main points I was going to touch on today, uh, just in terms of um, a bit more around managing cash flow and expenses in this environment. As Greg touched on, uh, everything has changed in the last couple of weeks. So I guess um, we were looking at a continuation of no revenue for a period, but um, thankfully we've got back to a trading scenario. And so I just want, but I just wanted to touch on a couple of. Um, key points that I think uh, that you should be aware of and looking at. Uh, the first one is just around time in management and financial reporting. Um, we see, uh, I think we'll see probably the most important uh, need uh, over the next 12 months and two years and into the future will be around time in management and financial reporting. Um, as we touched on um, the past history is, is, is really um, no indication of the next um, period of financial performance and therefore it's really important to start to have a think about your management and financial reporting and, and what's being received. Um, the question, what, what you'll see on the left there is really around the questions you should be asking yourself and asking your your management team and, and making sure that your board is receiving and um, what sort of information are you receiving and how long is it taking to prepare when you're receiving it and 
who has accountability and the information. Um, those are really, really important questions that you need to be asking yourself. And I think key benchmarks to be thinking yeah. about is you know receiving information two weeks after month end is not not going to be useful in making real and live decisions about um, cash flow expenses management of costs um, but also reacting to changes in revenue that, that you start seeing in your business in, in a particular in an environment where there's limited predictability so i guess it's really time to sort of look into um, you know, the, the quality of the, the management reporting and information that you are seeing on a daily, weekly, and monthly basis, particularly. Uh, the key, those on the right, really is around the best practice of what should be included. It should be timely. It should assist in real decision making. Uh, it should include cash forecasting, which I'm going to touch on in a bit, bit, bit further. Um, it needs to really include revised benchmarks, and I, I, would, I would strongly recommend that clubs are starting to rethink what they consider um, to be an appropriate benchmark under the current environment. Uh, make sure it measures all the way to contribution of different trading areas, looks at your EBITDA across the business, and make sure that it's really available when you need it. And the key, one of the key things here is to, to make sure that you're looking at the quality of the systems that you, uh, that you have, um, particularly financial reporting, point of sale systems, and making sure that there's a there's a strong linkage of those systems and qu and quality data reporting just to make sure that you're able to receive this information in a timely manner. Um, there's been a significant advancement in in, in technology of both in uh, general ledger and financial reporting systems, but also point of sale technology, uh, which can really um, you know, increase the, le the level of reporting and the timely level of reporting and there should um, in a number of hotel and operating scenarios there, there are some sophisticated systems that can look give you real-time reporting within a couple of days after the end of the month and that's something that's that, that is going to be very critical going forward Uh, just the next topic, I guess, or point was just around um, cash flow forecasting and three-way modelling. As Greg was explaining, <clears throat> this is going to become and has become for all business one of the most important tools uh, for for um, for, uh, for any business to, to sort of assess where they are now and, and, and where they're likely to be in the short term um, and medium term. So table on the left there, I guess, just touches on some key benefits. Um, you know, around you know being able to make informed decisions, providing leverage for discussions with lenders. Uh, we are finding situations at the moment where, um, you know, and even pre-COVID, where banks are starting to become uh, a lot more interested in in three-way models and cash flow forecasting and the sophistication of those to be able to make informed decisions about lending. Uh, and those that are much more prepared uh, prior to that. Um, are, re are really going to be on the front foot when it comes to discussions around covenants uh, and, and rates that are going to be included. So it's really quite important. It can really guide sort of capex and long-term strategy decisions, um, uh, and also really highlights pitch points in in terms of cash flow issues that may occur um, if if you uh, make certain decisions now, um, which not having these sorts of tools um, can really can really put you behind. Um, what is a three-way model? If anyone doesn't know, a three-way model is really a, a profit and loss statement, a balance sheet and a cash flow statement that is linked uh, and is an, enables you to understand the impact of a decision uh, in all three areas. Um, it, you know, very, in a lot of cases, you will see separate cash flow forecasts, separate management and, and profit and loss forecasting, but a three-way model really enables you to make accurate decisions about the impact of what your balance sheet might look like based on certain cash flow decisions or certain uh, operating uh, decisions as well. Um, I guess the, the, tape, the, the part on the right there just, I guess, talks about <coughs> the, the opportunity with scenario planning, as Greg was touching on around, um, a, a, a good three-way model really enables you to change scenarios when it comes to revenue. And this is going to be really critical in the current environment. Um, you need to understand how your business um, looks in six months time under a 50% revenue scenario, under a 70% revenue scenario, 
um, at, enable you to adjust wage costs and rostering to, to make sure that you are cash profitable. Um, you can look at, you know, you can use it to look at decisions around promotions and what those may cost and what revenue they may generate and really start to understand whether that the cost benefit of some of those decisions it can help you make decisions around debt structuring and whether or not uh, taking on particular debt for particular um, capex spend or other avenues um, is 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 uh, a good thing to be doing for the club and obviously capex is going to be a key one and um, you know, monitoring positive cash flows is not always uh, the most sensible thing when it comes to cash flow forecasting, there obviously needs to be a consideration of having free cash flow to be able to enable um, those other investing activities and spending money in, in refurbishing your club and, and renewing your poker machines and other aspects. So um, it is, I would recommend it's a highly um, sought, after, sought after tool and, and we have been assisting a number of clubs in starting to develop a three-way model um, because it's become a, a um, probably one of the most beneficial tools in, a, in, in this environment. Um, the third point I was going to touch on is just around the risks on around stimulus measures. Um, obviously the significance of all of the recent stimulus that's been announced and, and key areas being JobKeeper and the deferrals around statutory payments. Um, and I, I guess it's just a reminder that these policies have been very beneficial and obviously allowed us to um, uh, you know allow the number of clubs to keep a number of staff on the books and continue to be paid uh, there is a significant risk that comes with the with with the ending of these stimulus measures at the end of september uh, and it's not that far away i'm sure you're all aware that job keeper will come to an end there has been no indication you know, there's been a sort of a little bit of backwards and forwards around whether or not that will extend into the hospitality industry for, for a longer period, but at this stage uh, there hasn't been any indication that will occur. Uh, so um, there will be a lot of things to manage at the end of that, which comes particularly around this, uh, a large stop of, um, ceasing of in, income and cash flow, but also a number of pressures from existing staff around um, you know, wanting to be re-rostered and work, rework once and, and achieve um, you know, once they restart. So um, that's going to be a, a key pinch point in a lot of cash flow forecasts for club, um, for a number of businesses and clubs. One area there is just around management, accounting and benchmarking. I would be careful. I've seen a number of clubs deciding to allocate JobKeeper income um, to individual trading areas based on the staff that are allocated to those trading areas. and whilst I can understand that approach I, I would be cautious in, in you know um, allowing that to make decisions around rostering and contribution because ultimately it may only be for a period of three months that that's allowable and um, you really need to be monitoring benchmarks on a, on a no stimulus basis so um, I, I would be careful how that management re reporting is, is prepared and make sure that you're, you're completely aware of the decisions that are, that are being made, excluding any stimulus that might be received. Um, and then I guess just on statutory deferrals. Um, so this is, I guess, another key risk, particularly around some of the GST and income tax uh, instalment and POYG instalment. Um, deferrals that were allowable for businesses under 50 million of revenue or turnover. Um, that these are just deferrals at this at this stage, and so um, they really need to be built into cash flows, and and you really need to start to be starting to have conversations with the tax office about potentially about payment plans. Um, you don't want to end up in a situation where uh, you know these are all due and payable in a short period of time, as it may create another risk. Uh, and I'm sure you're all probably aware, but obviously gaming duty has been deferred, um, but there's still ongoing conversations at the moment as to whether or not that will be waived. Um, and, and that's something that will continue to be discussed. But obviously, again, until that decision is made, it does create the potential for, um, you know, a, a risky a risky time when it comes to the end of September. Um, and not to mention, I guess, um, the other aspect of this is which, um, money in the hands of your uh, 
uh, members um, when these sorts of stimulus measures start to cease, whether or not there we start to see some significant um, impacts on, on people's uh, income, which which may change behaviours for, for a number of your members as well. So just a few things to be aware. And the last thing, just quickly, I guess, is just around, as Greg was touching on, now's the time to review your cost base. Um, um, you know, I think it's time to sort of throw out history and start deep diving into your cost structure. Um, and as a real opportune, opportune time to sort of change bad habits and, 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 and affect overdue change. Uh, and I think this is something that needs needs to be a key focus. And I've probably just highlighted some some areas that uh, you know I would be reviewing, and that obviously it's a large amount of areas. But I think obviously admin costs. Non-trading wages are quite similar. Um, starting to look at your margins, and and making sure that you don't have any particular trading areas that are running at a loss. It's just not going to be acceptable in a, in, in an environment that we find ourselves in now. AEMP spend is a, is another big one. Um, you know, making sure that you have a good analysis of how much contribution that spend is really making to your top line. Um, reviewing long-term contracts understanding your donations and making sure and i think this is one area where uh, you know clubs have to be very careful about you know, previous donations um, that are being made to to the community and and whether or not that the club adequately has the right cash flow to be able to keep supporting some of those donations uh, as they would have done in the past um, obviously overheads and honorariums become a big topic as well so um, they're probably the key areas um, and, and really starting to look back and, and reviewing your cost base in a lot of detail. And the last couple of things really just as uh, um, some stuff I'm sure you've probably been aware of before is really just how to, uh, which we could go into a lot more detail on is how to be measuring the performance of your business. And, and I'd say that one key critical aspect in, in clubs is that even uh, earnings before interest tax depreciation and amortization as a percentage of revenue is a really good measure of the cash profitability of your club um, and you can see there that um, you know those under operating under 10 percent are really in a, fi a difficult financial situation you will be cash profitable but you um, are really putting your club at risk of not being able to um, continue to invest and renovate or, or be in a situation to react to situations uh, that may occur in, in this current environment. Um, anything from sort of 10 to 20% provides stable financial position and anything sort of going over and above 15 to 20 uh, is obviously where um, you wanna be in terms of being able to provide free cash flow to, to reinvest and, and continue to uh, focus on, on, your, on your club and the club's long-term strategy decisions. So I think, um, one thing you need to make sure you're monitoring and, and is included in that financial reporting. And the last one is just obviously looking at some general benchmarks and uh, these these get thrown around all the time and I wouldn't suggest that they're always the right one. Um, they need to be looked at for your club um, and your venue uh, and, and they, they're going to differ dramatically and I, there is no uh, correct um, benchmark. However, I think you need to be monitoring some of these things and when we talk about key spend on AMP or wages that are related to non-trading or, or admin expenses, they're the core ones that I'd be focusing on. Um, how your uh, different trading areas contribute to your overall profit margin is something that's going to be different across the industry, so, um, but just things to, to, uh, to keep an eye on. Uh, so that's... Uh, and that's pretty much the end of my slides, unless there's any, any questions. So. Yes, well, Clayton, I do have a, a couple of questions have come up with regard to EBITDA. And I did have uh, one person who was waving a hand, Andrew Nagel, if you have a question, if you could type it in the Q&A box, I can make sure your question is asked as well. But on the uh, Q&A uh, list, one uh, comment was, is EBITDA really worth measuring monthly? And we had another one that said EBITDA targets can also assist in achieving cash flow requirements to meet your ongoing payment obligations. Do you wish to comment on both of those questions for us, uh, Clayton? 
Yep. Um, so I, I would say on the first question, just around whether you should be measuring it monthly, I, I agree that you. Sh I think that you should, particularly in this current environment. Um, cash flow positivity um, is is going to be really, really important. And I come back to my first point around. Uh, but in in this current environment, there is no past history to guide yourself at all. And um, whilst we might see an influx of performance in the first couple of weeks from reopening. We have to be conservative in our approach. And I think that it's important that you are remaining uh, cash flow positive and you are maintaining a good EBITDA percentage uh, because it, it does demonstrate your ability to react and, and hold cash for future decisions. Um, All right, uh, hang on, I've got another. Okay, Clayton, no, that's all right. Um, will clubs, oh, here's another question. Will clubs be looking to repay their cash burn rate from the last three months ahead of other investment? To repay their cash burn rate. I think that means recover the cash they've lost. Okay. So instead of investing, re restore liquidity is I think what it means. Yeah. Um, look, I, I think that's a sensible thing to do. I think, um, yeah, I, I, I think obviously, as Greg was touching on in the first part of the presentation, I think we need to, there needs to be a definite conservative approach to strategic decision making at the moment. I think it's obviously going to be very different for each club um, based on um, your cash flow and, and your cash holdings and investment holdings that you have at the moment. Um, but I, um, you know, and I think what, what some of the stimulus measures have been able to do is to maintain clubs, cash flow holdings. So I'd like to think that in a, in, in a lot of scenarios, uh, clubs are able to start to re, you know, re, to repay their, the, the burn from those last three months in the, in, in that mm -hmm. first couple of months after reopening. Um, but I, I would agree, I think um, investment decisions need to be made with caution, um, particularly until we're, we're past this and particularly until we start to see some consistent trade I don't know, Greg, if you had any different views, but... Uh, look, I think uh, it's going to be a question of scale. I think uh, some of the larger clubs uh, will recover probably more quickly, but some of the smaller clubs with, with tiny cash flows where they might have accumulated some reserves over many years uh, will be really impacted badly um, by, by the the cash or the liquidity they've lost through the closure. Um, so, you know, I don't think they will recover that quickly. I mean, some of them, for some of them, it's, it's years worth of savings gone, um, particularly the smaller ones. So, um, and if they, and, and they've probably never been investing much anyway. Um, so I, I think the, the answer is that uh, some will, will delay investment, but th those who delay investment run the risk I guess where the others that invest step further ahead, and it just widens the gap. So, uh, I think I think the best thing that can can occur is for that gaming duty deferral to become a waiver, which will put some liquidity back in. Um, mm -hmm. And obviously, the, the the handbrake on investing can't be forever. It, it has to um, it has to have a, a time frame. And I I think sure, surely the first part is liquidity for a few months maybe, um, but you wouldn't want to stop investing for a year. Yeah, I agree. I uh, have another question from Guy. Where do you start on revenue projections for the next month or two? What is a reasonable percentage of historical revenue? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, I think, and I think it comes back to my um, the benefit of really being able to model scenarios. So, I mean, I guess we conversations we were having before uh, opening recommenced. I guess was that um, most clubs were looking at sort of forty or fifty percent probably in that first few months afterwards after reopening. Um, since that time, I guess obviously looking at the results that have come in in the last few days. Um, most clubs have seen some really strong performance on Monday and Tuesday, um, which has probably indicated similar performance to similar days in, in pre-COVID. Pre um, but I guess it's the question of rush and, and how quickly that will um, 
start to die down. Uh, I think probably some of the indications of what most people I've spoken to have been doing, we're probably looking at anywhere from 50 to 60% in that first couple of months, um, with a view that by the end of the year, we were um, starting to achieve more like 80%. Um, and it wouldn't be into the next financial year until we started to really factor in uh, anything above that. Um, but I think everyone's probably likely to have a slightly different view on that. Um, and I think the really important thing is going to be, I guess some of the challenges are going to be that um, when it comes to weekends, um, that with the you know, restrictions around numbers in clubs, um, that you're not going to be able to achieve the same level of trade on weekends as you would have. Um, during the week and what we've seen in the last couple of days, obviously with this sort of level of restrictions, um, you know, probably a similar numbers are in the club to what in, 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 in clubs that probably were pre-COVID as well. So, um, or in that last week or two before when we, we, we did have social distancing before closure. So um, that's probably what I would suggest. I don't know if anyone has any differing views, but. I think, I mean, my summary would be, yeah, start conservative and then get aggressive. Don't start aggressive and then find you have to become conservative. Uh, you'll be in a much better position if you start off conservatively and, um, and your budget succeeded. Uh, and, and clearly when you're dealing with your bank, you'd, you'd, you'd rather go that way if you can. Um, and I think if you, if you budget for 100% of, or even more than what you had when you, before you closed, you, you're really lining yourself up for a poke in the eye. All right, we have another question from Glenn, which both Greg and Clayton may wish to uh, respond to. Do you have a view or opinion on how long a club should evaluate before reintroducing any promotions? <laughs> Who wants to go first? Uh, well, I guess it, 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 if you don't need to buy business, why would you buy business, I guess is the answer. Hmm. Um, if if you if your club is up and running and you've got people that are spending money at a rate that is entirely acceptable, um, well, perhaps you can save yourself six or seven or eight percent of every dollar you've received. You may not have to spend all of that money ever again. I don't know, um, but you know, I think that the worst thing to get into would be a promotion cost war with 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 every other venue. Uh, that that's a that's a that's a that's a fight to the bottom. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would agree. I, th I think there's uh, it's one opportune area. I think you know clubs can spend anywhere from six to ten percent of their revenue in post, um, uh, and maybe even more uh, in, in in promotional activity. And if you can avoid some of that expenditure, I think it's really a critical thing to be looking at. Uh, and you know, I've I've heard comments um, in other other meetings that you know there's a general wish that all clubs would throw out all um, point systems and everything else all at the same time, and there wouldn't be any competition. Everyone would just uh, you know save save some some money during the next the next six to twelve months. You know, so I think I think there's a general feel that what used to work is probably not what people the model that people apply may may apply going forward. All right. Yeah, we have I think Glenn, sorry, Gary. Glenn asked how long. Um, I'd be. Uh, I'd probably see what the first month looks like before I start reintroducing a cost that you can't can't escape from. Mm. I think that's a sensible starting point. But I'm, that's just an opinion. I, I can't prove that's right or wrong. Well, there's another question for you, Greg, from Terry. Given what has happened, how will the pursuit of revenue diversification be viewed in the next twelve months? That was a topic that we were talking about. Uh, last year at last year's annual conference of the association, um, so it's it's timely to say what 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 will we be doing in the next twelve months? Well, I, I think it'll it'll probably it'll still be on the table, but it'll probably be a little bit further down the list. I think getting the core business back in into shape for many is going to be the primary focus, and and I guess the question of what you diversify into because. There's, there's some clubs that have diversified uh, and they've, they've diversified into income streams that um, are as, as affected as, as, as hospitality because they are part of hospitality. Um, if you looked at some of the statistics that were published, I think it was um, 
clubs had seen an 87% reduction in revenue in the, in, the, in the closure period. So there's some clubs that have got 13% of their revenue still being maintained. So that's probably some golf clubs, maybe some yacht clubs, uh, maybe a, a little bit of membership income. And I guess the rest would make up for some form of diversified income stream. Um, yeah, I think it's still on the agenda, but I, I think the focus has to be getting the core business back into shape and performing before you start allocating a, money, a lot of money into um, diversified income streams. All right, thank you for that. Well, that's right, uh, answered all our questions that we have at this stage. Hang on, maybe, no, there is one more. I think I've got. Ah, uh, this is from Pam, who's one of our Queensland listeners. Um, so far, they're not allowed any gaming. Um, what do you advise for venues who are yet to have gaming approved? So the Queensland venues are not allowed, yet allowed to, to operate their gaming machines, I understand. Well, I mean, it's, you've got to work out whether it's worth opening. I, I'm not sure if they have takeaway out there or not in their venues, but if the cost of opening is higher than the cost of closing, it's, it's probably that analysis, or maybe um, come to New South Wales. <laughs> well, yes, Sorry, many Pam. venues, when the, when the limit was only 10 people in the venue in uh, New South Wales, a lot of clubs didn't open because the yep. costs of, re of opening were way beyond the, the, what revenues they might achieve with the limit of 10. I mean, we in New South Wales are now only able to operate, you know, semi-viable venues because we're allowed 50 per dining room, which in some cases allows venues to have, you know, 200 to 300 people in their venues. And that's, it's when you get to those numbers that the business is actually viable. All right, well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, I've put on the screen the contact details again for each of our three presenters today. And I wish to express my thanks to Greg Russell, Henry Koakis and Clayton Everly for their presentations. It's been very informative. We have recorded this presentation uh, and it will be uploaded tomorrow onto our website if you want to share it with others or advise other people in your club uh, to uh, find out the further information that was provided today. Our next uh, presentation uh, will be in um, two weeks time, our next web webinar. Uh, and it is being called COVID bar and beverage service requirements. It'll be held on Wednesday, the 17th of June at 1 p.m. And we have speakers from uh, Lion, from De Bortoli Wines, from Coca-Cola Amatil and from Hunter Technologies. But uh, thank you for your participation today. And thanks again to Greg, Henry and Clayton. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Gary. Thanks, Gary.